Hello and uh, good afternoon from Hyde Park. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Chris Wheat. I'm the Executive Director of the Stiegler Center for the Study of the Economy and the State at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Today, we are excited to host a conversation on China and big tech with Ling Shen and Matt Sheehan, uh, moderated by Ling Ling Wei. This is the second installment in our series on China's political economy, featuring scholars and experts to discuss the country's changing political uh, economy environment and its implications. And in academic parlance and, and fitting for the last day of finals here on campus, uh, last month we had our China Political Economy 101 discussion, if you will. Uh, you can watch that video on uh, the first event on our YouTube channel. And today we move into more advanced coursework on the interplay between the Chinese government, its economy, and its relation to technological firms uh, housed both inside and outside of China's borders. Before we begin, please note that we are on the record and we will also post this event um, uh, on our YouTube channel later. We will take questions towards the end. You can submit them via the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screens. And as usual, views expressed by guests are their own views, not those of the Siegler Center or the University of Chicago. We hope that you will join the Siegler Center for more upcoming webinars, including one on uh, in our Unpacking ESG series on March 28th. Uh, you can check out our website for more details. Uh, you can also find out information on our digital publication, promarket.org, and subscribe to our Capitalism podcast. You'll find in the chat function links to many of the Siegler Center's uh, events and exciting programs. Now, let me briefly introduce our speakers. Ling Shen is an assistant professor at the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University and is author of the book, Manipulating Globalization, the Influence of Bureaucrats on Business in China. Matt Sheehan is a fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and is author of the Trans-Pacific Experiment, How China and California Collaborate and Compete for the Future. Last but not least is our moderator today, Ling Ling Wei. She is the chief China correspondent at the Wall Street Journal and co-author of the book, Superpower Showdown, How the Battle Between Trump and Xi Threatens a New Cold War. Without any further ado, I will turn it over to Ling Ling. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. It's my pleasure and honor to be moderating such an awesome panel for our discussion today. Uh, both of our panelists are superstar analysts on China's tech sector. The fact that we got them together today will make for a fascinating discussion. So the floor is yours, Matt. Great. Um, thanks so much, Ling Ling and University of Chicago and, and Ling Chen also for joining. It's uh, really excited to dig into all this stuff together. So uh, we arranged, I'll, I'll give just kind of a quick five minutes um, intro to how I'm approaching these issues, and then I'll hand it off to, to or, or Ling Ling will hand it off to Ling. So, you know, Chinese uh, technology firms in the state, it's a giant batch of questions that you can approach from so many different angles. So in this first five minutes, I'm just going to try to give kind of a a high level overview and sort of a historical overview of how I've seen that relationship change over the last say 10 or 12 years. Um, and to do that, uh, maybe I'll kind of show how I got into this and, and how I sort of observed those changes over time. So I lived in China 2010 to 2016. And during that time I worked as a journalist there. Um, I did a lot of reporting on China's tech sector and especially its connections into Silicon Valley where I'm from. So in that time, you know, I was reporting on a really exciting time in China's tech sector, sort of the explosion of new apps and WeChat, the growth of the venture capital scene, all this. But I'd say in doing most of that reporting, it was a lot of talking to uh, private sector actors. There's a lot of talking to, you know, the VCs. It was talking to the Chinese entrepreneurs, the, the Silicon Valley companies coming out to China. And that's, it really felt like that's where the action was. And that's where the, you know, the key actors were in some way. And the government was always very much a factor in these uh, discussions, but it didn't always feel like the, the sort of the central character in a lot of it. I think the way that it was a factor was somewhat prescribed. There were kind of three main ways that I saw the government sort of shaping, acting on, or interacting with the tech scene. And this is obviously a simplification, but just for kind of context, I think maybe the three ways I see it as, first off, they, they really, the Great Firewall set the parameters for competition. 
you know, they basically blocked most of the big foreign platforms that are, you know, information platforms, Google, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. And by doing that, they kind of cleared space in Chinese tech scene for homegrown giants. A lot of them were growing up already. They were already competing, but the firewall is a big factor in just kind of clearing space and shaping how the tech industry grew. The second big way that it was a, the government acted on or acted with was it obviously it set the parameters for online speech and online information in China. You know, there are kind of ebbs and flows of how free uh, online speech and online information was in China. Sometime maybe 10, 2010 to 2012, it's a really exciting period for Chinese social media online. It was kind of raucous and there's a lot of political discussion. But by 2013, China had kind of built the tools and the bureaucratic mechanisms with which to control how information is shared online. So, you know, it kind of set the parameters of the market with the firewall. It set the parameters for content with its sort of uh, whole bout of censorship uh, activities. And then it was also kind of a, a catalyst for the industry in a lot of ways. You know, Chinese tech is very, it historically was very private sector driven. That's where a lot of the first activity happens. That's where a lot of the momentum starts. But the government could sort of weigh in and be a big stimulant to the growth of an industry. So I saw this firsthand. I, I spend most of my time looking at China's AI industry these days. And I saw that firsthand in the way the AI industry grew. It had a long history in China. There's a lot of research, a lot of activity um, going on. But in 2017, when the government came out with its big national AI plan, that was a big marker that just stimulated so much more investment into the industry, so much more public sector adoption of AI, and just a lot of activity and company formation. So, you know, in this period, 2010 to 20, say 17, 18-ish, the government, it's setting the parameters for competition with the firewall. It's setting the parameters for speech. Um, and it is stimulating certain industries and helping them take off. But it, it wasn't like the government was always in the day-to-day -day operations of all the companies. Sometimes with some of the content, micro blog platform type stuff, they were really embedded and involved. But the government wasn't, uh, it wasn't the main actor in a lot of these ways. And what's interesting is over the last two years, you know, China, the Chinese government has just thrown out so much more regulation and so many more disciplinary actions that it's, I think it is fundamentally kind of changing the shape and the nature of those set of interactions. A lot of this gets traced to fall of 2020, when the Chinese government basically canceled the IPO of Ant Financial, the financial wing of Alibaba. Uh, Ling Ling did great reporting on this at the time. And from that point to the present day, there's just been so much thrown out there. There's, there's anti-monopoly stuff. There's uh, new AI you know, regulations on algorithms. There's closing down the online education industry. It's just been kind of throwing stuff at the wall. And it's been almost like a tidal wave of this kind of stuff. They've been taking ownership stakes, maybe is the most kind of extreme example. They took a board seat in ByteDance and a board seat in Weibo, the real content platforms. So I think that's changing how what the relationship is. I think there's a lot to dig into on that, but I don't want to uh, talk for too long in this opening. So, you know, I think maybe we, in the discussion, we can kind of break down some of those new regulations, maybe into some buckets that make sense. Um, but I'll leave it there for now and, and hand it back. Excellent. Um, thank you so much, Matt, for this um, excellent overview of the uh, uh, evolution of the relationship between the government and the tech sector. Uh, now the floor is for Ling. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Ling Ling, and thanks, Matt, for um, joining us. Um, I'm really honored to be here. So build on what Matt just mentioned, I wanted to um, just sort of also draw on my research experience and experience chatting with the tech sector about what is there's a difference um, between China's understanding of the tech sector and the U.S. understanding of it. So if you ask a random U.S. friends and what are the major tech companies in U.S., they usually come up, the first thing they come up is like Google, Facebook, and Amazon, right? Um, they wouldn't say Intel, Qualcomm, and Broadcom. Usually that's not the case. Um, whereas in China, the word tech sector and high tech sector sometimes get blended in a way that they only focus on the high tech industry in their uh, whatever, um, they have a catalog of high tech industry. So um, 
a lot of times they're understanding what Alibaba and Jingdong and Didi and Tencent are, are different from what the U, typically US way of understanding the tax sector. So it's kind of um, hard to understand sometimes why China trying to build technology independence and self-sufficiency while they seem to be uh, tightening control and crack down the tax form. So I was trying, uh, I was trying to, um, uh, understand this and and today I just want to draw on uh, several couple of things. The first is that the online platform are usually in Chinese perspective associated with bubbles because their success is not necessarily traced to hardcore technology but rather they were viewed that as have first mover advantage um, and that would make create monopolies and rents and uh, and that will can easily become the targets of anti-monopoly law and anti-trust uh, law also these online platforms sometimes not always are um, linked to financial platforms such as the ants group with alibaba um, and so alibaba does part of the r d in ai technology for sure and actually state like that part but the ants group um, in the state view is creating sort of creating shadow banking almost and um, in, in order to prevent um, against prevent this kind of thing to uh, be against state re regulation and against state financial uh, markets regulation that's part of the reason this state is going after the ants group now the second thing is that these online platform uh, also control as we all know, sensitive data and users' data. And even um, they have operated for a couple of decades already. The state regulators seem to be just wake up to realize how important it is to regulate this data, to regulate the algorithm and all those. Um, but not, the state doesn't necessarily have experience. The state has a lot of experience um, or know uh, what it is semiconductor chips, but the state does not necessarily have enough experience about data management and regulation. Um, for example, DD, China's Uber had, has you know, China has a lot of record, like just daily routes of uh, who takes the DD and those government officials, ministers, when they get on and off the car and all those. So that's sensitive data. That's why earlier last year, uh, we saw that there are seven ministries um, trying to go went to DD and regulate the data, ask them for data and regulate the data. You know, there's a lot of ministries, uh, there is the uh, Internet and Com uh, Communication Office, the Public Security, State Security, Natural Resources, Transportation, Tax Bureau, Market uh, uh, Supervision Bureau. They all try to insert themselves to regulate, part partially due to the turf wars, you know, among different bureaucracy, but also partly because they did not yet, they still yet to figure out what is the standard way to regulate. Um, but also on the other hand, when you need to pay attention that in some of the, the so-called tax sector and high tax sector, the governments are still, the attitudes are still trying to support them or promote technology development and, and growth and independence. They may not, may or may not doing it in the effective way, both at the national level and the local level, but they're doing it. For example, the semiconductor chips or uh, Huawei or whatever, th what they regarded as uh, a core tech sector or core technology. So there seems to be like, um, I don't know, um, a, um, a division, right? A division of views and have a very different um, varied views towards what um, counts as tech firms and what different tech, tech firms do. And that partly explain the state's uh, attitudes towards them. So I will stop here and I'm sure there are gonna be a lot of interesting comments and questions. Great, Ling. Um, really appreciate your, um, you know, so carefully helping us basically um, understand um, not all tech is equal in China. Uh, there is hardcore tech, there's platform economy, whose tech is more associated with first mover advantage, as you talked about. Um, so that uh, what you said and what Matt just said really paved the way for uh, a few really uh, sharp questions uh, from, um, you know, from our audience as well as, um, you know, yourself uh, as well. So the first question is really um, from Matt, given that your expertise is on AI. So China has declared its ambitions to be the uh, number one world leader in technologies like AI. Uh, and yet the Chinese government has rolled out a ton of regulatory policies and punishments that seems to be hurting um, those AI platform companies. 
How do you explain that seeming contradiction? Sorry about that. Yeah, I, I think this, uh, it connects to a lot of what Ling was just saying on these kind of divisions between say frivolous or the way I think of it, if I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of a Chinese official is, you know, they kind of see a lot of tech as kind of frivolous and they see some tech as productive, you know, deep tech or sort of productive industrial tech. And AI really spans both of these things. AI is a sort of an omni-use technology. You can use, you can apply it to almost anything. You can apply it to online shopping. You can apply it to autonomous vehicles. You can apply it to surveillance. You can apply it to anything. So the AI industry is kind of caught on both sides of this debate in some ways. And you do start to see maybe the tensions in China's sort of high level goals emerge. 2017, China's AI plan, they're very clear, you know, by 2030, we want to be the global center of AI innovation, kind of whatever that means. It could mean a whole lot of different things. Um, but it, it comes into conflict with other goals. It comes into conflict with goals about maintaining party power in a kind of uh, ideological sense, in a sense of ideas, you know, AI algorithms are constantly shaping what people see online. They're shaping what kind of attitudes, what kind of news is spread. Um, they're shaping, you know, shopping patterns and finance patterns online. And that gets very much to some of the like systemic risks that regulators might see that Ling Chen was referring to. So I think in terms of the AI regulations over the last year, China's rolled out a bunch of these. They've rolled out regulations on online recommendation systems, you know, the kind of the core of online AI. They've rolled out regulations on deep synthesis or deep fake technology, a lot of different stuff like this. And in the US, we often see these things as very much, you know, we, we describe them as, as in conflict with each other. Hey, you know, the big tech companies say, hey, don't regulate us because then we won't be able to compete with China. If you overregulate us, this innovation is going to go elsewhere. I think the Chinese government sees it differently. They always see, you know, the fundamental bedrock of the, of China being a productive uh, leading power in the Chinese Communist Party's mind is maintaining Chinese Communist Party control. You know, you can't let these companies run too far ahead. If it's going to create social problems, if it's going to create financial and economic risk that undermines the party's control, then there's no, you know, there's no hope for China as a leading power. So they, I think they're very clear on that kind of bedrock issue. They probably honestly looked at what happened in the US between say 2015 and the present day. They looked at the role of social media platforms in division, in political influence and stuff like that. And they said, you know, uh, not, not for us. You know, they already had tight controls on information. They said, you know, we really, really don't want that. So I think that, that, yes, they are bringing these tech companies in some ways under, under control, under greater scrutiny, under greater regulation, but they see it all as, as maintaining a solid kind of political foundation on which the country can continue to progress and build. You know, will this work? Will this, uh, will this over constrain the tech companies? Will it direct investment in certain ways? That's another set of questions. I think probably when it comes to China's AI development, the biggest problem for them is access to semiconductors. Um, you know, the US has imposed a lot of controls on semiconductor exports and semiconductor manufacturing in China. And when the Chinese leaders are looking at their sort of long-term AI future, that is the key building block. And in a lot of ways, these regulations on all tech companies, they're kind of redirecting investment and, and energy away from what they consider these kind of frivolous tech activities, online shopping, you know, whatever. And they, they're funneling more and more of that investment into semiconductors in different ways. VCs now know, hey, don't put money into the next social media platform, put it into the semiconductors, so the government's going to subsidize those and the investment's likely to pay off. So I think, you know, you have these, these different reasons why the regulations are rolled out. They want to maintain the sort of a solid foundation and they want to redirect these, these activity and these flows of investments towards what they see as the sort of their most important long-term problems, which in at least AI are, are often seen as semiconductors. I think that's kind of how I, I imagine they're approaching this and how they see that tension. Uh, that's really good, uh, great perspective, perspective here. Uh, you know, based on a lot of conversations we have had with entrepreneurs in China, you know, in tech sector and others, um, what has happened over the past year, the kind of, uh, you know, regulatory storm, however you call it, um, really has um, had some kind of damping effect uh, on, you know, 
the desire to keep innovating, uh, keep innovating, keep spending, keep expanding. So uh, the next question is for really uh, for Ling. You know, based on what you have seen and your research, what kind of impact you have seen so far on Chinese technology innovation? Is the government uh, achieving what Matt just laid out? You know, redirecting capital into the areas that uh, the government thinks you know should uh, be promoted. Uh, the so-called you know hardcore technology or fundamental technology uh, are, are you seeing that kind of uh, any kind of impact on what is happening in practice thank you yeah, thanks um yeah that's a that's a great question and um it's also a hard question that the government are definitely ha are um setting up what we call an Nationwide system or in Chinese, right? to uh, encourage technology innovation. And they know that, um, you know, this tech sector is very important. They try to emphasize um, crucial, core, crucial technology. Um, that a lot of times get uh, nowadays under the context is, you know, semiconductor chips and uh, a lot of heart. Uh, hardcore um, uh, stuff. Now, this is not the first time that China is trying to do that. You know, um, back in 1990s, there is this, uh, there is various billions of money poured in uh, into companies like Huajing and Huahong. They're not Huawei, but Huajing and Huahong, they're st uh, state-owned uh, enterprises that they're trying to build semiconductor chips. But the typical way is still, you know, they try to set up uh, joint ventures with um, uh, other countries, but um, the production is slow. They cannot the, because of slow speed, it cannot catch up with the quick change, the quick change of a different generation of the semiconductor chips. Now, um, this situation seems to be, the, at least perceptions seem to be um, um, ch gradually changing. And now under the US-China tech war and uh, everything, that state have to it emphasize not joint venture anymore, but uh, indigenous um, technology of semiconductor chips. In that regard, they did have um, uh, multiple uh, government subsidies, both at a national level, but especially at the local level for, through different layers and provincial and city level. And even that um, provincial city level, you see those high tech uh, zones that's set up for different um, these kind of uh, hardware um, high tech firms to, to to apply to get in. And they, they do invite experts actually of, of all kinds of experts to um, go in there to, I mean, they have piles of, I've seen photos of those, they have piles of document there and of a firm's application and they, they vent, they have, um, they look at the firms and they, they judge and have firms coming to do presentation. And then they decide which of the firms that can, um, or, um, um, is eligible for a government um, subsidy and government resources. However, um, that the fact that the, the Chinese government is doing it in a very quite systematic level uh, does not necessarily guarantee success, of course, because we, we're already seeing a, a you know sort of scandal uh, in Wuhan, like Wuhan Hongxing, for example, that uh, where you have government um, pour in billions um, to build this and, and attract talent from the Taiwan's TSMC to build um, semiconductor chip um, um, company. But because the finan financing part went wrong and it, the money cannot follow up, um, that in the end, uh, you know, you have this team uh, that sort of both, both, they both cheated the double government and they cheated the uh, expert from the hired from TSMC that these team of people just wrap up their money and fled away, right? So that that kind of scandal or failure cases, I'm, I'm sure there's plenty for. So I I don't think there is like a, a really final answer of whether China can succeed or not. I, only thing I know is they are seem to be um, doubling down that on their effort in uh, doing that. A great answer. Um, it just seems to me, you know, for any country, um, be it China or other countries, in order to really achieve technological breakthroughs, uh, you need to have free flow of data and free flow of ideas. Without that kind of system and 
you know, in ecosystem in place, no matter how much money you spend on those sectors, um, it's hard to really imagine any kind of breakthroughs happening in the near future. I, I guess semiconductors um, is, is one of the, you know, um, main examples there. Uh, then that leads to a question from one of our audience, um, uh, either Matt or Ling, you know, whoever you, you want to jump in, please just jump in. Uh, the question is from Andy uh, Peterson. Um, same, you know, along the lines we just talked about. He's wondering if either of you can comment on the new, uh, the new personal information protection law in China and your views on the impact that will have on US-based organizations doing business in China. Yeah, I'll first flag, I'm not a expert on China's data protection regime. There are people who you know spend tons and tons of their time on it. And I just flag for, uh, for the audience member, Sam Sachs, S-A-M-M Sachs, um, is uh, currently at the Yale Law School Paul Size China Center. And she is, I think, she's usually the person that I go to for all questions on China data protection um, laws and regulations and their impact. So I'd, I'd highly recommend sort of looking into her work. I think maybe I can just put it in a, you know, a little bit more of the global context. I think China has often been at the leading edge of sort of more restrictionary uh, tech rules that China rolls out first. And we think, wow, that's pretty extreme. Like, you know, are the global tech com companies going to kind of agree to play with China's rules? Or are they going to, you know, refuse and exit? Like these seem infeasible in some way. And then often the world is kind of a few years behind in eventually adopting somewhat similar things, just often with much less severity. So, you know, China was the first country to on a very high profile, I shouldn't say the first, I'm sure North Korea, you know, beat them to it. But China was one of the first countries to place a lot of demands on foreign platforms coming into China in terms of content, you know, basically getting Google to create a censored search engine within China, and sort of geofence a lot of content for China. And at the time, we thought, you know, wow, this is too much, you know, Google won't do it. And then it won't, you know, it won't succeed in different ways. But this is actually, you know, Google exited, but this has actually been an increasing trend in countries around the world um, that governments feel more empowered to place high demands on these tech companies in terms of geofencing content, blocking certain content here and certain content there. It's not the same as China. I wouldn't equate what China does to what the EU does or what Germany does. But similarly, a lot of countries have kind of learned from what China has done in that respect, they've, and they've placed high demands on geofencing content and companies like Facebook and Twitter and others eventually accede to those laws. In data protection, I think I see something of a similar thing in that China was a very strong early mover in terms of demanding data localization for companies, um, demanding that companies like Apple set up data centers in China and demanding that they store all the data of Chinese citizens within the borders. And while it encountered a lot of, kind of led to a lot of hand wringing in, uh, in a lot of sectors uh, saying, you know, this is, this is a problem, this is, gonna, this is a, not gonna work or companies shouldn't agree to this. But increasingly, this is what countries around the world are doing. You know, India's rolled out a relatively stringent uh, data protection regime. Other countries are following suit. So, you know, in terms of the actual sort of business impact on U.S. companies or the mechanics of how they store data there and how they get it to the U.S., um, that's a little bit beyond my purview. I would just note that, like ByteDance, for example, you know, ByteDance, the owner of TikTok which for a long time, the US government had similar concerns about are you taking Americans data and sending it back to China? The news broke, I think last week, that ByteDance seems to be in the final stages of coming to an agreement of storing all the global data in America using, I believe, now I'm gonna mess it up, whether it's Oracle or Cisco, that was going to be their kind of partner in this. But it's, it's a trend that's being replicated in other places. That doesn't mean China's right to do it, or it doesn't mean that it's a good idea or anything like that. But I just, I often with these tech regulations, if we see China move first, we think it's kind of unfeasible or going to destroy innovation or something. And then other countries around the world end up using that same leverage to get their own concessions from the tech company. So just a high level take. I have a follow up question on that. Sure. So the government in China has the access to all that data. What have they used that data for? I mean, one big concern among U.S. companies, as I understand it, 
is that you know they would use that data and you know for a purpose of uh, tech transfer, you know, get into your proprietary information. And, um, you know, that's one of the worries that when the rules come, came out last year, a lot of analysts were worried about Tesla, right? Tesla was required to store all its data inside, um, produced in China, inside China. But it's a, uh, how would that impact Tesla's ability to innovate going forward? Because the, it's a global system, yeah. right? You need to access the China data to do, you know, all the, yeah. um, you know, technology innovation. I'm not a tech person, yeah. so pardon my, um, you know, uh, phrasing here. So, what are the government? What are what is the Chinese government using the data for? Primarily, give me maybe one or two, three main purposes. Sure, I'll kind of break it down into two things. One is kind of how much access or what kind of access does the Chinese government have to data that's stored in China? And then how does this relate to the kind of uh, intellectual property innovation side of things? So on the on the access to data side of things, you know, they're requiring that data be stored within China. They are not requiring that Tesla kind of just like build a pipe, you know, a data pipe that goes from their headquarters straight into Zhongnanhai government headquarters and just kind of dumping it all in. In general, data is uh, it's kind of context specific and it can't just be kind of pooled into one giant data set that the government can then sort of draw from at will. It's stored in specific data centers with specific access requirements. Now the Chinese government has a lot of leverage over companies existing in China. So the way that I think about it usually is that, you know, while Tesla might not just be shipping all its data to a, you know, a Chinese military or government processing facility just for them to own, if it comes down to it, companies have a very hard time saying no to the Chinese government when their kind of back is against the wall. So if the Public Security Bureau goes to Tesla and says, hey, we believe that these 1,000 Teslas around China are being driven by you know, criminals or, or you know, someone doing illegal activities, you need to, according to you know, national security law XYZ, you need to hand that data over to us. In that type of situation, Tesla's in a tough spot. They're probably going to accede to that demand. They're probably going to hand it over. But it's a kind of a different thing than just like the full-on sort of transfer of data. You know, of course, we don't always see behind the curtain who knows exactly how this is going down. But you, you do see similar things in other countries where, you know, the big American tech platforms don't just ship all their data to the U.S. government. But if you come to them with a court order, then usually they are often put in a position where they have to comply. The difference being in China, there aren't nearly as many legal protections, obviously. So that's kind of on the access component of it. On how it relates to innovation and uh, stuff like that, I draw a little bit of a divide between access to data that is sort of generated in the process of, of action. So, you know, someone's data when they're on TikTok, how do they use it, stuff like that, versus the intellectual property that goes into building the TikTok algorithm. Usually, in at least historically, if the Chinese government wants to know how it's built, they will hack that company and they will steal the intellectual property, which is different than the kind of data stealing stuff. With this example you cited, it's actually a good one because it's autonomous vehicles where this is a little bit more crossover between those. The routes and the, the data that the cars gather when they are driving, they're constantly gathering data that becomes training data to train the algorithm and to make it better. So it's maybe a little bit more overlap um, between those. And you know, theoretically, the Chinese government could get its hands on a lot of autonomous driving data from its different companies and then use that to do its own training of its own algorithms. That's within the realm of possibility. And maybe autonomous vehicles are kind of an interesting one to watch in that respect. Excellent. Um, another question from our audience. Uh, maybe this one's for you, Ling. Uh, so the question is, uh, historically, we have not seen China's enterprise software sector take off in the same way that the U.S. has. Is this now changing given the change, uh, the change uh, in the aging wor workforce policy efforts to modernize SMEs, et cetera? Oh, is there still hesitation to procure software externally? Um, uh, yeah, uh, so that's an interesting question, although I'm not exactly expert on software, I would say that um, the, the notion of software also changes, like in the old days, we say software is something like we, 
we use a disk to install on a computer, that's a software. But now software development mostly took the form of app development. And in terms of the app development, China actually has made quite a bit of progress. However, all those progress on the app development, usually it's for commercial uh, use and in took different, uh, different, different forms, um, are usually only targeted at the China market, which means that they're really hard to use if you are trying to use this up from abroad. Or, you know, a lot of people probably haven't even heard about this app because, you know, there's not many users from internationally. I, I myself had the experience of using the Chinese software, China app from abroad, and it is very cumbersome. It's uh, hard and you can't not get it logged in or all those problems occur. So um, I would say there are progress, but not in terms of the progress of, you know, of international uh, software. Um, part I, I believe, of course, that that is also related to data uh, regulation and data management. Um, but the the I also want to mention that the the field of data management of data regulation is also um, fairly still new for even for OECD countries. Um, I've seen that there's a change of rule and norms in, uh, among OECD countries as well. And also um, there is also an anti-monopoly antitrust, for example, on Facebook often you know, uh, receive fines and things like that. So I think it seems like um, all kinds of countries um, are trying to like grow groping in the darkness to some extent and trying to figure out what is most effective to regulate the data, uh, whether this is going to hurt innovation. Um, uh, I, I, I don't have a, a conclusion just like Matt. I worry that to some extent it will, of course, but I also don't have an um, like answer of what's the best way to balance um, all these goals. Okay. Um that's um uh you know that leads to uh what what which both of you Matt and Ling um have talked about is you know the kind of impact and implications uh there are for China's tech sector as a result of last year's crackdown. Um, as you both know, and also I'm just incorporating some questions from our audience here as well. Um, as we all know, in the past few months, uh, the Chinese government seems to be some, some kind of course correction because China's economic growth uh, is fast losing its momentum following the crackdown. Uh, just this week, uh, Pri uh, Vice Premier Liu He, Xi Jinping's right-hand economic guy, reaffirmed his support for the platform economy. Uh, companies like Alibaba, like Tengxin, uh, like um, Baidu, ByteDance, you know, all those companies that uh, form the platform economy. Um, and and, and what, what's your take on, on Liu He's speech and the recent, you know, uh, turn in policy? Do you think that signals um, a real turning point in the tech crackdown? Yeah. That's a great question. And it was a really interesting week for this with Bill statement. You know, there, there's just, you, you call it a regulatory storm. I like that word because it's just, you know, it just it kind of feels like it's all around you. It's coming out, you don't know where it's going to strike next, that type of feeling for, you know, now about 18 months or something like that. And, you know, Leo has statement for those who, who didn't get a chance to read, he, like Ling Ling said, he's kind of the, the economic czar for China and perceived to be close to Xi Jinping. And he basically sort of said, you know, hey, like, Let's let's pump the brakes a little. Let's cool it on the kind of haphazard, all over the place regulation. He said, you know, we want to quickly bring this kind of spate of regulatory actions to a close. We want to finish this round, and then we want to come up with sort of predictable regulations going forward. And I think you know this kind of makes sense. A lot of Chinese policy is made this way. There's kind of some high level signal that hey, you know, we, you know, the top top leaders prioritize X area. And then you'll see all the different bureaucracies, all the different bureaucratic actors just trying to do something to achieve X goal. They'll start rolling out their own local programs. They'll throw out new regulations. They'll stimulate whatever, you know, so uh, in this case, the government kind of signaled like, hey, we want to, you know, rein in big tech or we want to regulate big tech. And so you had all these different bureaucracies just kind of doing, you know, whatever they had. They're kind of unloading, unloading the cannon on these companies. And then once the government has seen how this has kind of all played out to a certain extent, then they, they 
they sort of select from that big set of actions and they say, okay, going forward, this is how we're going to do it. They pick the methods that they think are good. In this case, you know, we've had, yeah, like 18 months of just open season on big tech companies. Probably the biggest thing that happened in this last week is there was a huge, huge fall in the stocks for all of China's big sort of listed tech companies. Uh, you know, I've, like 30, 40% for some of them. And that's where the financial regulators steps and says, okay, like a little much guys, let's, let's cool it. Let's try to make this regulation predictable. And basically you can see them, you know, after kind of going all over the place for a while, trying to achieve a new equilibrium where the regulations achieve government goals. You know, they have lessened the power of these companies. They have made a more, you know, uh, what do we call it? Like a, a more effective marketplace. You know, you've broken up some of the monopoly powers. You've kind of taught everybody who's the boss. And now let's make these kind of predictable, regular regulations going forward. So it's probably bad to make predictions about China, but I would predict that this would be a, a relatively significant turning point. Well, I just want to quickly add that I always love Liu He because he always came out to say things I would like to hear. Um, during, you know, when there is a big concern about the growth, uh, uh, which is the advance of the state and the, the retreat of the private sector during that time. He's also, I mean, that, that was a couple of years ago. He's also the one that came out and says, no, we're not doing this because we're complementary to each other and we are occupying a different segment of the value chain. So certainly it's not necessary that we're just cracking down the private sector in advancing the state sector, right? Um, so he tends to say the things that I always love to hear in the right direction. Um, but uh, I just wanted to also caution that China has so many different ministries and so many different departments. Who knows if those de departments who wanted to advance their um, power for regulation, for example, just for the sake of just like a bureaucratic power would uh, go in a different direction. So I don't know, I just caution uh, 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 about that. But I have to say that Liu He always say the things I wanted to hear. That that's pretty much is true. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, such a good point. You know, I have covered him for the past 10 years and basically tagged along with him in certain ways throughout the trade war and highly respected, um, you know, technocrat in China. I, I do think he has lent um, a certain amount of credibility to China's policy making. However, I would say you keep changing your policies, that's not a recipe for success. Nobody's gonna believe you next time you change it back. Um, so uh, a related question from our audience, uh, Ling, is that you know should China keep leaving some breathing room for companies like Alibaba and Tencent, um, despite the fact that they're not in the hardcore tech sector? Um, as you know, as we have seen in the past couple of days after Liu He's speech, Chinese stock markets immediately surged. Um, and however, you know, people in China's tech sector were saying, oh, how about re-upping some uh, DD apps? How about resuming and IPO? How about letting Biden's list? So do you think they're going to do more to help restore confidence in the market in China's tech sector? Um, I, uh, so here's, th that's my guess. I mean, as an observer, I can uh, guess the best is that because right now uh, it's the, the tech sector, what's going on with tech sector, you know, is also intertwined with many different things. There's the COVID that's still ongoing in China that definitely still continue to influence the economy and since um, the uh, change, the, the, uh, Russian Ukraine war, there's the, the completely um, bad performance of the stock market, right? So uh, at some point, the state probably will have some concern about its economic legitimacy. I mean, the e economy cannot be too bad. The stock market cannot be uh, going down for too long. Um, so that unknown itself may, um, that's my guess, may propel the state to have some um, policies to restore confidence. And one of the way to restore confidence is to uh, loosen some of the uh, control in some of the less, less sensitive 
um, areas. Um, that's just my guess. So it may not directly result exactly what Alibaba want to do or exactly Didi's uh, uh, re-inauguration or whatever, um, but it may be like overall they, they, they will start to give some signal and that was the big, where the big uh, direction that it, the state policy is going. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was just going to add on. I, yeah, I think that, that Ling has it right there. And, you know, you you were referencing some things that are being said, I think, like online or within the tech community, you know, let Alibaba, or let Ant List and stuff like this. I would predict that if they want to restore confidence and they want to stimulate the economy, they won't do it by going back and correcting, you know, previous kind of mistakes just because they don't you know, want to lose the face of saying, oh, sorry about that. We did that wrong. They're probably more likely to say, hey, look at this shiny new sector. We really like this one. So, you know, go ahead, invest away, that type of thing. I think it's probably less likely that they will in some ways walk back some of their more assertive you know, party power moves and more just say, hey, like, can we stimulate activity in this new area? Yeah, well, let's see if they do more to help restore governance. You know, words are cheap, action really matters. Uh, uh, next question, maybe for you, Matt, from audience who works in AI. Um, uh, he said, it's important not to exaggerate its effectiveness. The worst problem it faces is bias. The data we choose to collect for our databases is biased by what we think um, it should be important. The data we select from our databases to build our algorithm is affected by the same biases. Data scientists have their own personal biases. So what reason do we have to believe that China's AI efforts will not suffer from the government's control? Very good question. And yeah, uh, one that both gets to some like core issues with the technology and you know how much faith do we put in its ability to kind of spit out some ground truths and also you know the Chinese government control side. I think within China, maybe I'll I'll put a couple of things on the table. One of them is that the Chinese government and the Chinese AI industry itself does uh, talk and think a fair amount about bias within AI, bias within algorithms. You know, they clearly use AI in some very, very objectionable ways, including like racial profiling of uh, ethnic Uyghur Muslims. That's a kind of, you know, bias that they are building into the technology that both the government is, you know, the government wants and that companies are, are willing to execute on. So there's, the, there's a carve out for that kind of political, what they deem to be politically sensitive or having to do with social stability areas. But outside of that, in China's sort of AI governance frameworks, they do, they, they've started sort of an initiative around trustworthy AI, which is a, a phrase that's used internationally as well. And in those, they do list sort of, you know, bias as one of the uh, main pillars that they're looking to do research on to combat and stuff like that. So I just put it on the table that they're very sort of aware of this problem, at least on a technical level. Um, you know, I think probably within China, maybe more that bias would be like regional bias or accent bias. If you're from, you know, Henan, like can the algorithm, you know, is it treating you differently in some way because of your accent or how you, you know, interact with it? So I'd say they're aware of it and probably trying to solve it on a technical level. I think maybe the, the core thing that you're pointing towards also is just like long term, will the Chinese government be imposing its biases and in some way pointing the technology in a direction that's not productive or not accurate? And I think that's a a big open question. They they clearly have goals. They they say you know we want AI to be used in these ways, not those ways. We want it to be uh, deployed to you know uplift the real economy, and and just the uh, the data the data honestly that you gather in China is is limited to China itself. The companies they don't have the global reach of American companies where we can you know Facebook is drawing data from Africa, South America, everywhere, and that gives strengthens the algorithms themselves and making them more diverse. I think in a lot of ways, the Chinese government is okay with the bias that it is introducing because they think that they know the truth and they think that they are right and therefore biasing in that direction is okay. But I do think long run, especially when you get to kind of deploying AI internationally, the fact that China is working from uh, data sets that are more homogenous, more ethnically homogenous, more sort of nationally homogenous, 
that will maybe be a hurdle towards them developing and deploying these technologies globally. So um, all, all of us um, have touched upon the topic on regulation predictability in China. Uh, this question from our audience, what is the status of open source in China now? Either of you. Uh, Ling, you got something on this one? <laughs> I'll come at this is another one where it's not my area of expertise. Um, but you know, I read a, a bit about it and um, and we'll just try to give some thoughts. I think on I'm trying to remember the names of the people that I look to the most for open source stuff. I guess one person within the AI realm, there's a scholar named Jeff Ding, Jeffrey Ding, who runs a great newsletter called the China AI Newsletter. Um, where he uh, translates documents in Chinese. And somewhat recently, he's done a few things on the Chinese government's approach to open source. And I would, you know, for a proper answer, I would recommend reading some of that and searching around a bit online. I would say kind of historically, Chinese government had a, a sort of a mixed relationship to the online open source community. Open source is, you know, a technical, it's, it's a really a, it's a pillar of the global technology ecosystem. It's when people sort of uh, develop, build code, and they just put it online and make it freely available for anyone to use. So a lot, even a lot of AI technology, a lot of facial recognition algorithms are open source. You literally, you can just kind of go to GitHub is the big international one, get the code and deploy it in your own context. So in contexts like that, China has benefited tremendously, like Chinese actual you know, technologists and users have, have really benefited from GitHub and from deploying that domestically. Chinese government is also a little bit uncomfortable with the fact that a company or a, a platform like GitHub is not based in China. Um, you know, as we're kind of watching stuff like the Russia sanctions unfold, this is in the back of Chinese leaders' minds is, wow, you realize the more reliant you are on global networks and global systems, the more subject you are to these type of, you know, to the US or Europe tightening controls over something. And so similarly, if they're looking at something like GitHub, they often say, hey, can we build a domestic GitHub? Can we build domestic open source AI frameworks that have enough traction, enough vitality to uh, sort of be, be self-sufficient? So in the AI realm, you have these AI frameworks um, where the big ones internationally are PyTorch, which came out of Facebook, and TensorFlow, which came out of Google. They're basically open source toolkits that help ease the process of developing AI. And Chinese companies have started trying to build their own. Huawei try, is building, I believe it's called MindSpore. And uh, what's the other one? How am I forgetting it? It's a facial, it's a computer vision company has built a similar framework that for some, it's slipping my mind right now. The Chinese government is, is well, they've benefited historically from international open source. They feel a certain type of way about that. And they're looking to build up their own open source capabilities domestically to both kind of strengthen, you know, it's a form of international soft power in some ways. If your companies and international companies are using your framework, that's like technical soft power. Um, but also because they maybe see that as a more reliable backstop in, in the event that they sort of find themselves cut off from the international networks. Great, um, we are running out of time. So maybe last two questions and one for Ling. Um, is China watching and learning from tech regulation that is happening in other countries? And what, if anything, can countries like the US learn from how China is regulating or governing big tech? Okay, I believe, uh, so I will answer the first half because I think the second half is exactly Matt's, uh, Matt's type of question. So the first half of how China uh, learn from other countries, yeah, so uh, because it's a new area, um, there is, uh, even though it may not be reported in the news, but I heard just from informal chat with um, officials and businesses that um, under diff all these departments like uh, the internet uh, uh, and the information, uh, the inter internet and the communication um, department and other uh, regulation department, they, they all have their actually re, uh, research teams that are actually bringing in the um, OECD countries experience of saying, when do they find um, business? When, do, when is this violating the data rule? Uh, what's the notion of privacy or individual uh, data users privacy? So actually they are 
um, to a lot of extent, it's influenced because um, long decades ago, we don't even have this notion of individual user data privacy, things, concept like that. So um, these um, kind of different research teams under these different offices or departments are uh, bringing in a lot of uh, new information um, for the China side to learn. But it doesn't, of course, it doesn't mean that they would just do exactly the same thing of what uh, Western countries do or uh, they're gonna just um, copy exactly the policy. So that's uh, that's the uh, information I, I got from um, informal sources. Well, I guess I'll turn it to Matt. Sure, and that's a great answer on the first one. For the second half, you know, what can other countries, what can the US or Europe or other countries beyond that learn from what's going on in China, you know, First, just stay up front. You know, we, I as an American, do not want us to copy China's approach to, you know, surveillance or the way that they regulate and allow a lot of, you know, human rights abuses and activities. Clearly, we're not trying to learn from that and implement it here. But specifically in the area that I look at, which is AI and AI governance and regulation, I do think it's going to be really important to watch what happens in China. Basically, because China is able to, in some ways, move quicker and roll out these regulations and kind of test ideas. They, in the realm of uh, regulating AI algorithms, they're basically going to be running a lot of experiments in what happens when you uh, sort of require that algorithms be explainable. What happens when you tell companies that they have to um, let users kind of augment the algorithms that act on them? What happens when you uh, require certain types of verification in AI systems? These are things that the Chinese government through brand new laws, like literally the last six months, is their requirements they're imposing on companies. And they're very similar in some cases to ideas that are being floated in the US or being floated in the EU. But basically, if we watch closely, we'll get a chance to see what happens when you actually roll those regulations out. Like, does letting users kind of look at the, uh, the way that an algorithm has tagged them and sort of delete certain tags, is that a meaningful form of user control? Or does it become a huge burden to the companies and kind of destroy the usefulness of the product? that what happens in China will be very good data and like inputs to our own policy making process. So I think in terms of learning from China on this type of stuff, I think we're in a really interesting time where China's gonna be running these experiments and we should basically watch what happens from them and use that as inputs in our own, you know, as we're facing our own trade-offs in terms of supporting technology, protecting users, uh, you know, influencing the economy. We're, we're gonna get inputs, we're gonna get info from China that should kind of feed into our own decision-making. Well, thank you so very much, both of uh, our panelists. Uh, this is a fascinating discussion. You know, the, the um, big tech in China and how China governs data, how China governs tech is going to be such a huge issue, not just for domestic Chinese companies, so for, you know, the global implications as Matt and Ling laid out as well. So let's, you know, give our panelists a virtual round of applause. Uh, I, you know, really appreciate your insight and thank you very much. Hope to see you both again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.